Unauthorized opinions expressed on the internet would be censored. We are live. We are live. This is real. <laughs> Welcome back to Unauthorized Opinions, uopod.com. Like, share, subscribe. It's pure propaganda and it's super cringe, by the way. I literally went to the polls with nothing in mind. I saw a can of orange soda in the parking lot. <laughs> and it's I was like, yeah, there we go. An unopened can of orange soda just chilling <laughs> in the parking lot. I was like, yeah, I got to vote for Trump, dude. Your podcast sucks it's mental mate it's absolutely mental i'll be honest i thought it was kind of offensive when you talk so much about the loch ness monster political climate and andrew treat yourself okay especially if you start i don't know getting getting in good with homeless people unauthorized opinions streaming everywhere at uopod.com cock a doodly doodly doo <laughs> boom boom Boom, 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 boom. Check, check, check. Welcome back to Unauthorized Opinions, uopod.com, patreon.com slash uopod, and every other pod. I mean, we're going to talk about suicide pods. I don't know if that word is banned off of YouTube yet. Spotify, of course, censoring us for talking to the uh, women from the NCAA volleyball teams. Luckily for us, I guess, we don't have that to cover this week, but maybe a little bit of self-deletion or you know, Clinton, Clintoning, uh, I don't know what the word for the Clinton body count is, uh, unalived, I believe, actually, it comes to mind as, but we've got some good stories about suicide pods, and we've got some stories about some failures of DEI, and that will be the precursor to our interview with a guy named Sean Brem, and we'll tee that up a bit later, but basically, quantum computers are here, and they're, they're pretty freaky. To give the executive summary of that one, the even further summary would be that soon, you know, if all goes well with the quantum computing stuff, you'll be able to talk to anything on the, you'll be, you'll be able to talk to the internet. That's basically what this is. Advanced AI, quantum computing, and you will be able to talk to blocks of text, essentially. And blocks of text will have a form of intelligence where it can describe itself to you. But more on that later. I want to start off with, um, if we can get another screen on here, I would love that. Sony over here, and you can see at Return, which is a subsidiary here of Blaze where I write at. Sony lost $200 million from a studio, a gaming studio that was pushing hardcore DEI stuff, ha hardcore diversity. And that studio was called, uh, I believe it's Firewalk Studios. And listen, the originally, everyone thought that Firewalk Studios had come out with this game called Concord, and it cost them around 80 to $100 million. That was the original estimate based... And, and people make these estimates from the gaming industry and based on games that they've put out of similar similar styles. But I want to just go ahead and show you what this game was about before you really realize, you know, and well, you're going to realize here why it lost money. So it's characters that had multiple morbidly obese, you know, women for some reason. This one's named Imari, obviously gigantic person. And you've got, you know, Aliens of color, I believe you were calling them. Several obese players. There's one right there. This is the one we're on right now. And they have she, her pronouns there. And we can go to this other one. This one named Lark. This alien was undecided on, I guess, Zim, Zer, or their pronouns, which is odd. You know, they're ba they basically are telling you that pronouns exist in a different galaxy timeline whatever and if this was a joke if this was the before times as we call them that would be a funny concept that aliens in a galaxy far away have pronouns they have this super intricate thing it'd be like saying they have <laughs> i don't know chick-fil-a sauce in a different galaxy this super specific thing that has just popped up over a certain amount of time exists in a galaxy far, far away. But no, what the, their meaning is, is this is so normal. It's so normal that people identify as non-binary or whatever that they have this in different galaxies. There's, there was also a robot. Um, let's find that. Uh, 
this robot had uh, its own pronouns. They were he, him. So apparently even androids have robots. It's a, tra it's a trash can with pronouns. A trash can with pronouns. That's what we were working with here. And so the Concord game lasted 14 days. And this was before it even came out. So the Concord game lasted 14 days before Sony pulled it from the shelves and said, we're not selling this anymore. They even issued refunds. That's 14 days. A project of this magnitude. Sorry, I'm a little off kilter here. A project of this ma magnitude lasted on the open market. <laughs> like, it's rare to see any game pull from the shelf at all. But they pulled it from the shelves, I'm guessing, because they didn't want to pay for the servers. That's how bad it did. And, you know, took it off of physical shelves, digital shelves, gave refunds, everything. This was aug in August, it released, and then after that, uh, in early September, it was pulled. So fast forward about, you know, another six weeks or however, I reported on this on October 31st, and they completely shut the studio down. And as this was being released, this information, I believe it was people over at Kotaku, those wieners, and then IGN reported it, that it was actually revealed from inside sources that the company was at least $200 million. Or the project was at least $200 million, plus how much it cost them to buy the studio. So Sony said in their blog... Um, Let's take a look at that. So Sony puts out this blog and acts like it's not a complete trash pile that they just threw out. They ended up saying that they closed two of our studios, Neon Koi, which I couldn't find too much information about, and Firewalk Studios, expanding beyond PlayStation devices and crafting, engaging online experiences alongside our single-player single, single player games are key focal areas for us as we evolve our revenue streams. We need to be strategic, blah, 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 blah. You know, mobile action games regarding Firewalk, as announced in early September, certain aspects of Concord were exceptional, but others did not land with enough players. And this is something I always say. It didn't land with enough players. It was spectacular stuff. It didn't land with players so much that we shit on it and took it out after two weeks. That's not just not landing. That's being a disaster. We spent considerable time these past few months exploring all our options. After much thought, we have determined the best path forward is to permanently sunset the game and close the studio. So that's the terminology they're using there. And if we check on over, back to my article here, I say initial reports estimated a $100 million loss for the studio given the cost of similar projects. However, insider testimony has since revealed that the game's initial, initial development deal was over $200 million, not counting the rest of the studio's agreement with Sony. Citing sources familiar with the agreement, Kotaku reported that $200 million was not even enough to cover the game's develop it, development and did not include the purchase of Concord's intellectual property rights or the purchase of Firewalk Studio itself. So $200 million didn't cover the project. So let's say, let's be generous and say 215 plus the property, the IP that Sony was to buy from them and the purchase of the studio itself, which probably was, I don't know, how many millions would that be to purchase a studio? 10, 50, who knows? I think conservatively we're looking at 225 million to 275 million or somewhere in between there for how much Sony actually bought from this or paid for this. Now, Firewalk had this ridiculous statement, the studio that they closed, and they put it on Twitter, and it's so delusional, it's enraging, okay? It's so delusional that these people are cosplaying right down to the end. Firewalk is signing off one last time. Firewalk began with the idea of bringing joy of multiplayer, blah, 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 that stuff we can skip. But here's what they said that they did. We built a new genera next generation first person shooter engine. We managed an acquisition integration while readying technical. That's just, you know, we were bought by a larger company. That's what they're bragging about there. Ship and deliver a great first person experience to players, even if it landed much more narrowly than we hoped against a heavily consolidated market. So it didn't sell, but it's actually the market's fault, they say. 
We took some risks along the way, marrying aspects of card battlers and fighting games with first-person shooters. Although some of these and other aspects of the IP didn't land as we hope, the idea of putting new things into the world is critical to pushing the medium forward. That means trans stuff. That means non-binary stuff. That means morbidly obese characters. They are putting this out in the world because that's what they want the world to be. They're weird people. They can't just create a video game that people like. They want to create a video game that literally manipulates people and does some for, some sort of uh, social experiment and, and social engineering towards what they want. They finish with, please, I would, this is another thing leftists always do now. They have no, no qualms of asking for, begging for jobs when they're getting fired for stuff. Please reach out to recruiting at PlayStation for inquiries. And thank you all for the very, uh, to all the very many teams, partners, and fans who supported us along the way. Nobody supported you, but this is the weird part at the very end for me. See you in the Tempest, Firewalk Studios, dot, 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 and transmission. Now, you might look at that and see, well, they're just being clever and stuff. I look at that and I see these people are cosplaying right down to the very end. They don't take any responsibility. They just said it was narrow or... We didn't land. We landed more narrowly than we thought we would. We took some risks. And we, you have to do this to push forward in this industry and be more progressive. And it was the market's fault. And then end transmission. These people are living in a fantasy world. They want to push their fantasy beliefs of gender ideology. They're going to blame you and the market when people don't believe in that stuff because it happened weeks before it launched, people were criticizing it. When it launched, people were criticizing it. It gets closed down and then their studio gets closed down because Sony spent hundreds of millions of dollars on it. None of that was, sorry, we missed the mark on this project. Uh, we're going to rally together maybe and try something new in the future. None of that. It was the market's fault. We have to push forward with these ideas. That's what you have to do. And we're still cosplaying in our little world that no longer exists. Your game doesn't exist. Your studio doesn't exist. And transmission. They're cosplaying. And Sony's taken uh, notice of this. Other studios are going to take notice of the Warner Brothers. All these other studios are going to take notice that these DEI-driven companies, they don't care about their money. They're playing with Monopoly money because it's somebody else's. They don't care. They hire their friends. They hire their lovers in many cases, uh, their longtime business partners. They they hire these people and they shell out tens of millions of dollars to these these independent studios and these narrative writers like Sweet Baby Inc. I don't believe they're involved in this project, but there are other DEI companies involved in this. Somebody decided to put pronouns on there and morbidly obese people in there, character designers story designers, whatever, they give these people tons of money and they focus way more on political activism in their games than making a game that people want to play. That's just the long and short of it. And then they, and what do they do when they lose a, you know, Sony, uh, who was generous enough to buy their studio and give them this money and put belief in them. What do they do? They say, and transmission, we're still in our fantasy world. Nothing was our fault. We don't care if we blew all your money. And they probably said to them, like, what do you guys, what else do you guys have? How can you save this? And they don't have anything because all they have is pushing their ideology. That's it. And you want more proof of it? I'm going to give you more proof of it. This game that just came out, Dragon Age, which is uh, Dragon Age Veilguard, a game like 10 years in the making. The last one came out in 2014. This had monstrous implications for its studio. So many people were looking forward to these games and then it start, started to come out. How are they going to do, mess this up? And months ago they came out with um, the fact that everyone was going to be able to be in polyamorous relationships, all the characters, there's going to be nudity. So all this weird stuff started leaking and not even leaking. Actually, they started talking about it openly the game creators, they said everyone's going to be able to, no matter what creature you are, you can have sex with other creatures. There's going to be nudity in it. It's really weird stuff. I feel like I'm talking like it's really weird stuff. You know, they wanted, they wanted the nudity in it. They wanted creatures to have sex with other creatures. We never used to, we never used to have these creatures having sex with each other. We liked it when it was certain creatures, dogs and cats, maybe, but not dragons, not in this age. So it was promising in its 
weirdness, right? But I don't think anyone could have predicted this level of weirdness. So what Dragon Age Veilguard, and I watched uh, I watched friend of the channel Cabrutus do a cre- the created character on there, and it's all like, you can change the Adam's apple size, you can change the size of the breasts and everything, but maxed out, it doesn't go very far. You can change the bulge size. You can have pronouns, you can be non-binary, all these things. And, you know, most people, I think, thought that was going to be the the end of it. Like, that was going to be the extent of it. You can create a non-binary character, whatever. You can give it septum piercings. You can l- make it look like a transgender person. But that was probably not going to affect the gameplay. Even if you could be in relationships with a dragon, dragon or whatever, that's just, like, open-ended programming. Like, that's just not having to change anything in the game. Because if you think about it, if you've got a male character and then you make it so that only female characters respond one way, that's just a limitation you don't have to put on it, right? So I think most people thought that was going to be the end of it. But what we have here in Dragon Age Veilguard is literally the game chastising you about pronouns, about... about, uh, using the wrong gender pronouns about being transgender and non-binary. And then it tries to teach you this weird lesson. So what you're going to see here, this girl's going to talk. She's going to misgender somebody. And at that point, you're going to think it's the end of it. But then they bring it back up and talk about non-binary people in the universe. And then they mention, then they actually talk about how you should, you know, the proper way to not misgender somebody or to apologize to somebody. Let's listen. Snake's nose, she's still holding the ruby in her other hand. Maker's panties, I was so proud. Oh, uh, um... Did uh, you catch that? Before that happens... Watch, I believe she says she here. Pounding that snake's nose, she's still holding the ruby in her... So she said she there, and the other person in this is going to get offended that she used the word she. Her other hand. Maker's panties, I was so proud. Oh... Uh, um, ah, shit. They, they're still holding it. Sorry. What are you doing? Pulling a barve. Oh, okay. A barve? Tradition in the Lords of Fortune, from one of our old members, Barve. Good guy, but like most of us, his plans went sideways a lot. Bad blood among your crews, not good for morale, but there's not always time for big drawn-out apologies. So when one of us screws up and we know we've screwed up, we do a quick 10 to put it right. Pull it. So she misgendered somebody. This is like mythical creatures, mythical beings in a mythical realm. But we've got an English Indian woman here. She misgendered somebody and she said in our crew or whatever, instead of having a long winded apology, we do 10 push ups to punish ourselves to make it right. Pulling above. Oh, there we go. I'm glad the Lords of Fortune have Tarsh's back. Oh, Tarsh isn't the first non-binary member of the Lords. Really? It was a little before your time, but Horlicks was one of ours. Huh. Bastard looked better than I did in a dress or pants. And out of... They couldn't... <clears throat> So they talk about they're not even being the first non-binary person. And then when they say the bastard looked better than me in a dress or pants. So she couldn't even say that the guy looks better than her, a female in a dress. She had to add in that it also looks better than her in pants because we can't even corner a person who believes they are a woman into wearing a dress. They have to all, how does that work? How can the guy look better than her in pants and a dress? It's, he. Let's see what else is in this. This is insane. Of them too. Hmm. Any reason you can't just apologize? Sometimes people say, oops, sorry, and hope that fixes it. But they just want to get the whole thing over with. Trust me, I know. But pulling a barve, you sweat a little. Makes you think about it a little more. Shows the other person you mean it. What if they mean it when they say they're sorry, though? And that's the other reason. Some people mess up and get all dramatic. They make it about them. 
Oh, you know, I didn't mean it right. I'd never do that on purpose. They feel so bad about it that it's on everyone else to smooth it over and make them feel better. Oh, oh, okay, yes, some people might do that. Pulling a barve puts it on the person who screwed up. They made the mess, they fix it, done. So that's insane. This is a video game, which I'm guessing the storyline isn't just about transgender or non-binary people. It's insane. So she's saying that it's not good enough to just apologize. And they say, why can't you just apologize? And she said that just apologizing makes the person might not believe that you really, really think you screwed up. So you have to do push-ups and put sweat into it and really show that you care. Because some people will say, I didn't know, like it's not my fault. So it's your fault for not apologizing to somebody, or it's your fault for not knowing somebody's pronouns. And even when you apologize, you basically have to grovel is the lesson here. And then, of course, they have the one girl sounding like she's five for some reason. These are all these weird, and I will use the term intersection, intersectional here, to show you that it's this weird cross-section of perversions and beliefs in all these games the fact that they had you know you saw all the options there or if you're listening they had all these different options where you could select the fact that they had somebody go through and record this makes absolutely no sense imagine you're playing some other game whether it's a game about the matrix or it's one of those story modes in a in madden football and they just had this weird tangent about why you should support trump wouldn't that raise like tons of alarm bells? Wouldn't you be like, what does this have to do with football? Or what does abortion have to do with like the matrix? Maybe it has more sense in there, but like some random political topic off to the side, just forcefully injected into this game and then tells you how, if you disagree with it, that you're wrong. These people can't see that for some reason. Maybe they do. Maybe I'm the one who's foolish here. And I think they do know that they want to push it through anyways. But the idea here, again, just like the last game, is to make it seem normal. They need to push their agenda forward so that it seems normal. But even a person that agreed with them, they should be able and be coherent enough to say, why is this in the game? Even if I believe in pronouns, why would we need to talk about it in this game? Why would we need to develop dialogue surrounding how to properly, you know, grieve or feel bad about misgendering somebody. That doesn't make any sense at all. And this is an insane level of narcissism that these people have put into their own games. And I can't understand it. And I want to look up for you. The um, audio people are going to be like, what's he doing? I want to look up for you the, the charts for Steam. Which is, of course, where a lot of people t uh, go to to rank how well a video game is doing because tons of people play it on there. And um, we've seen an up and down graph here of 70,000 players, 84,000 peak. It's gone up a bit since it started. But, you know, 84,000 for a game of this magnitude actually isn't that much from what I understand. Like, obviously, it's monstrous the score here is 75 percent but a game of this size sorry i don't think you guys could see that a game of this size should have a lot more people there are still old games counter-strike grand theft auto 5 that have tons of people playing at all times and you really want to, if you hope to be a game that people play for a long time, which of course they do, you want to have more than that if you're pumping millions of dollars into this right now. So Counter-Strike 2 is still number one. Um, let's see where it is. It's number 12 right now. And I mean, I'm having the number 12 game in the world is fantastic. Don't get me wrong. But all these old games have such a dedicated fan base, it's hard to track that. But I, I think over time, you're going to see this go down even further. And I think that people are getting a boost right now. It's a new game. I don't think it'll have lasting ability. I had said from the beginning, I think it's too big to fail. But I think, I think you'll find that those numbers 
are very low for a game of this magnitude. I want to see the, the Metacritic scores here to show you, again, what people are really feeling about the game. Because a lot of these um, Dragon Age Inquisition, the Veilguard reviews. So, you know, of course, the industry is giving it 84%, but... 3,000 people have taken time to write reviews about this game, and it's got a 3.8. That is not good. That is not good at all. A couple of them, a lot of people are giving it zero. I've been a fan of uh, Dragon Age since the beginning. Let's read a few of these. Played all the games, and I must say that I was impressed by how bad this was. This Dragon Age is so different from the other one. Choices don't matter, even though it's advertised as such. And the writing is so unbearable, they ruin this great intellectual property. After 10 years, we were expecting something better. This is no longer Dragon Age. This is Fortnite in the Dragon Age universe. After Andromeda, apparently Bioware did not learn from their mistake. You know, I think these are um, amazing 24 hours. Let's see more use reviews what people are saying. Truly did not feel like this universe. Felt more like a poorly written fan fiction take. Bland, boring story. Childish art style betrayed. This person said it's a, it's literally fine. Leave your culture war ass. Leave your culture war stuff at home. The trans stuff is fine and unobtrusive if you aren't trans. See that? You can't have a problem with it. And a person just going to arbitrate. 10 out of 10, they're saying. It's literally fine. Even though it's 10 out of 10. There's no honesty in this. You give something a 10, and maybe there's no honesty in a zero. But I can see how one might say, you know, this game isn't anything that I thought it was, and they're pushing an ideology on me, and I hate it, so it's a zero. But for you to go and say it's just fine, and you like it, but have no other explanation other than to counteract, you know, things about transgenderism, I don't know. How is that? How are you saying it's a, a 10 out of 10 and you're just write, not writing anything about it? You know what I'm saying? I wanted to play this game. I have played every Dragon Age and Mass Effect. I played games to get away from political and wicked mentality of the people today. Now they've taken it upon themselves to be God and tell me I'm wrong. I will not be lectured by mentally ill degenerates. Somebody says um, there's a husk of a decent game here. It's buried in bad decisions. I will not hold the woke stuff against them since it was clearly on the product box. So I will pretend the woke stuff doesn't exist for the rest of this review. Person who gave it 10. I mean, I, like, when you create a game, is this what you want it to be about? Do you want people to talk about the gender ideology that's in it? Or do you want them to talk about, actually, the game itself? But what they've done is made... Their video games a battleground for ideology, which is an insane position to make because you're never going to please everybody. And now you've at least alienated 50% of your audience. If they had what? If they had double the audience, they'd be at 140,000, which means they'd actually be up or up in a sixth place. So obviously they'd be cutting their, their spot in half by eight rankings. Or sorry, by, uh, yeah, by six ranks. So... You know, they're cutting their audience in half. It kind of shows in the statistics there. Um, I don't know what to tell you guys. Besides, these things will continue to fail and people will continue to, you know, fall off the cliff so long as it's not their money. The last thing I want to talk to you guys before we get to our wonderful interview is Suicide Pods. And if you didn't know about Suicide Pods, this is actually a phenomenon in Switzerland. Whereas they have invented a way for you to get gassed into a pod just like this. What a lovely woman she must be. And you can read this on return at blaze the blaze dot com. Excuse me. And I don't want to give away too much of this article. There's a lot to go through, but I'll just explain where it came from. The suicide pod is called the Sarco, and it's been in development since twenty seventeen. The investor coined himself the Elon Musk of assisted suicide. Dr. Philip Nischke 
told Newsweek that he's been drawn to the world of euthanasia since he was a young medical school graduate graduate in Australia. So without getting too dark, and I know there's stuff on YouTube about this, this product was developed by a guy who's obsessed with assisted, you know, uh, unaliving people. He wants to delete people so bad that his first prototype was helping people unalive themselves with the help of a laptop. It was a laptop hooked up to an intravenous system. The computer would ask a patient if they wanted to be deceased, and then it would trigger an injection of things that would make you unalive. And he managed to do that with four people in Australia between 96 and 97, a brief period when it was legalized. Uh, then it was struck down and made legal again in 2022. Made legal again in 2022 because that's the popular thing to do now. He was sev- uh, he was 70 years old then, and admitted that his work surrounding how, how best to <laughs> trying to translate in my head to not get it flagged by YouTube. Admitted that his work surrounding how to best help people become not living has taken some time. I've spent the last 20 years fighting for the legislation that just passed. He said so. Very creepy person. He said he's aided hundreds of rational unalivings and even published a book about describing the most painless and efficient ways to do so. This spawned his product called the Sarco. Now, it is help. It is done through a company called. uh, Hold on. Let's find that because that's a fun name, too. And, you know, the designer doesn't put it on his portfolio. That's the creepy part. It's called The Last Resort. His company is called The Last Resort. And what ended up happening was, is a woman used their product in Switzerland. And these people all got arrested. And nobody really knew why, because they they thought it was legal. One minister from Switzerland said that she didn't believe it was legal. They had a 64-year-old woman. They put her in the woods. They put her in one of these machines, and they said she went peacefully into the night, sort so to speak. Can't exactly say how because I don't know who's gonna censor me this time, YouTube or Spotify. But it was an American mother of two, a 64-year-old, and she used it because she had a bone marrow disease. But now they're accusing the creators, the operators of the machine, I should say, of intentional homicide. So basically what happens is the person gets in the machine, they press a button and nitrogen gas goes into it and suffocates them. So I'll just read on from here. This is the latest story about how they think that actually they killed the woman. The company behind the pod is a firm called The Last Resort. They commented on the matter saying on May 23rd, A 64-year-old woman from the Midwest in the USA died using the Sarco device. Co-president of the organization, Florian Willett, called the woman's death peaceful, fast, and dignified. He added that it occurred under a canopy of trees at a private forest retreat, really romanticizing the whole ordeal. According to LBC, Willett was the only person physically present when the woman died, with Sarko inventor Philip Nischke reportedly following the process via video call. However, he allegedly did not see the entire process... Uh, you know, pan out due to technical difficulties. Willett has been in custody for weeks since the woman's death, originally because the pod is illegal. At this time, Swiss Interior Minister Elizabeth Bohm Schneider told the Swiss Parliament that the use of the Sarko was not legal. The last resort has said its program is legal, however, and does not require specific approval because the user presses the button. The company also states that the user must approve must prove sound mental capacity before the act is carried out. The woman who allegedly did this to herself with the machine did so because of a bone marrow infection. However, witnesses said that when Willett was speaking to Nietzsche on the phone, so I would imagine this is conjecture here, I'm not sure what actually happened, but I'd imagine when he was on the phone or on a video call with the inventor there, Nitschke, there was other people around who could hear the phone call. So when Willett spoke on the phone to him during the video call, he reportedly told the inventor, she's still alive, Philip. The comment reportedly came six and a half minutes after the user pressed the button. The court also heard, allegedly, that Willett was continuously leaning over the Sarko to look inside and was confused by an alarm that may have been a heart monitor. 
A bunch of other people have been re- arrested surrounding this, but they've all been released since Willet. So they take this woman into the forest. They get her to press the button to unalive her. After six minutes of checking be- in the glass, thinks he's hearing the heart monitor. Maybe he tells his friend Philip, I still think she's alive. Uh, they arrest everybody at the scene and they ended up finding strangulation marks. The coroner said there were strangulation marks um, on the woman's neck. Uh, severe neck injuries. It was reported, I think, by the Daily Mail that said there is uh, strangulation marks. But the doctor set, testified that, among other things, there were severe neck injuries from a woman who pressed a button and released gas, apparently. So this is where technology is going, and it's scary. And I don't want you to connect this to, you know, what happened here to this interview that I'm doing. But I, this is just, you know, technology is moving at a rate that's so fast that people aren't paying attention to what's happening, you know, on different verticals or pathways. So on one hand, you've got suicide pods. On another hand, you've got people working on quantum computing. And I didn't hear about this stuff. I wouldn't have heard about this stuff unless I got an email uh, asking if I want to talk to this guy. This, his name was, I believe, Sean Brecht. Let me make sure I'm... Um, Sorry, Sean Brem, who is, you know, a really smart guy, former military. I talked to him for a while. And basically what you will hear in this interview is that he has a platform, a computer program, whereas if you upload any text to it, you can then talk to that text like it's AI. So if you want to upload your Facebook data you know, everything from your Facebook wall, whatever you've put on there, and then ask all that information. You just, you know, it exists on a page. Imagine you've copy and pasted text onto a page. You can then say, you know, what happened to me in 2007? What was the craziest thing that happened to me? And it'll answer it for you. But it doesn't have outside influence. So you can say, you know, in 1991, who was prime minister of Australia? And unless you've mentioned that on there, it's going to say, I don't know what that means because that's not in there. So it's a crazy platform that's like AI, but it doesn't have the influence of AI. It only has the information that you've provided to it. So what they they said they're going to do with this, and you'll see a write-up of the interview with me in a couple weeks, I believe, after the election. But what you're going to see is people having the ability to, you know, analyze their stock portfolio, analyze somebody else's stock portfolio. Maybe, you know, George Clooney is going to put his wisdom onto this page or Robert De Niro, and they're going to tell you how much they don't like Trump. But the idea is, you know, creator X or expert X is going to upload their knowledge to this platform in some sense. And in a way, you're going to be able to get their advice just through things they've publicized. And what I have was told was stock traders, guys who have a great history of making the right calls and making the right trades and our economists and stuff like that. They're going to put their information onto this platform so that you can go and, you know, say, what should I do about this trade move or what should I buy this into this company? And it's going to give you trading advice. And what you can do is you can combine your stock portfolio with that. If you feel comfortable with that, of course, you can combine any of these pages you want together. That's what I've told. So if I can, combine my you know my wife's Facebook page with my Facebook page and now all of a sudden both of our things are combined we can ask a co- what's the best most similar experience we've ever had when we weren't together or something like that you know what I'm saying you can combine two sets of information so you could conceivably combine your stock information with and apply this person's expertise to it all while not having to talk to them at all So the idea that you can actually talk to the internet, because if you have access to this, is real. You could take a page, you could take an entire news article, and you could say, you know, what was the point of this article? And I know you can do a form of that right now, but what the difference is, I would think, is that all these AIs have inherent bias that people are putting into it. You know, they might say uh, Nazis were black, or they might say uh, the Holocaust featured kangaroos. I don't know whatever lie these people come up with to put into their thing, gender, history, whatever, you can't do that when it's subjected to just 
this information. So I thought that part was interesting. I also think it's interesting to just be able to ask an essay questions. And he was showing me things right in front of my face where you got a whole bunch of move information about movie sales and then it'll come you ask it for a graph of the top 10 movie sales and it'll compile that in front of you make a graph and give you the code so that was the stuff we sort of talked about behind the scenes what this interview focuses on is how quantum computing is going to affect stock uh, stock trading and crypto trading so it's a very interesting i know i'm just some dumbass online who's a very good writer by the way he's a great writer one of the greatest writers not the best with technology not the best with suicide pods we used to love our suicide pods <laughs> so the interview mainly focused on compute quantum computing and how it'll assist with things like stock trading and crypto trading and then we got back, we got into the other stuff afterwards. So you'll read about that in my article. And, and it, on some levels, it was mind blowing. On other levels, uh, Sean Brem was his name. You know, a lot of the stuff was going over my head. But I think it's a useful tool for the internet that we'll end up seeing. So I think it's an er interview you guys will want to see and listen to. If you made it this far, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Hit the thumbs up if you're on YouTube or Rumble. Give it a like on X. Uh, give us a review on Spotify. and Check out the Patreon. We have bonus content there all the time. We love you. See you guys next week. Free speech uncensored. Um, in the growing years, I've become more aware of my data uh, VPNs, routers, everything like that. Ever since, I don't even know when it started, but as I've wanted more and more privacy, basically, probably, basically, probably, as I've seen where the data and how it's being sold, how it's being garnered by uh, tech companies, and, you know, I, it was a few months ago or maybe a year ago now when I was looking at one of my smart TVs and they just had a simple option. Agree to sell your data to basically anybody, and you get, you never get to know who it is. So yeah, through going through things like that is how I've become more you know tech aware. But I've always been into this sort of stuff. It's just with the uh, the the birth of this tech page on Blaze, where we've sort of hunkered down on a few certain topics. Well, when you're done, if you want to stick around, and I will show you what live what happens when you talk to your own identity and it's immutable it's transparent and you get paid for being you when we're done just indulge me for five minutes and i'm for just sure. gonna watch your head explode <laughs> when you see i would love that so sean uh one of the main reasons we wanted to chat or i wanted to chat with you was this note about quantum quantum computing being used for for trading now, yeah. as, as a layman, I would describe this to somebody else as, you know, we're going to use very fast computers to trade faster than other places or other people so that we can adjust the price first. We can get in uh, when a stock is low or a, a yeah. something is lower. And then that person is not going to be do it. By the time they get to it, the price is going to skyrocket back up, selling, buying, shorting people, whatever. Is that ba is that the layman's way of understanding that? It is in the classic sense. I mean, when you think about it, you know, when you look at, when you look at, you know, the yards of data that people get access to just to get that millisecond trade faster, I'm, I'm going to kind of be a contrarian to the way that most people think about it. Because look, I mean, if you look at, if you look at, you know, I've worked in big, big companies. I've worked in government, right? I've seen the machine. Um, when you think about the machine of trading, you know, the guys that are going to win no matter what, they're going to have no millisecond of the guys on the floor that are trading, right? So what quantum can be, uh, you know, everybody's thinking, oh, quantum computer, we'll, we'll just be even faster. Okay, you think you're going to be faster than a guy that's on-premise? Like, even if you're at quantum speed? Hmm. The real value of quantum computing for trading is not going to be about the velocity of the trade. It's going to be about the veracity of the trade. And that's a big thing. And what I mean by veracity is for the first time, you're going to be you're going to be able to take what the big guys use, your hedge funds use. You're going to be able to combine so much alt data at the speed of light. 
you're going to have a better picture of where the puck is going rather than where it's at right now. I mean, it's the Wayne Gretzky of trading is when, when you get to, when you get to quantum computing, what quantum computing allows you to do, whether today in existing systems, like uh, using a quantum ledger database and using, you know, anal algorithms, quant we, you can run quantum, quantum algorithms right now. People don't realize you can build a quantum algorithm and use it on a classical system and just absolutely, you know, blow things away. My chief scientist wrote, wrote one of the most successful quants in history for, for trading. Right. Um, so you can use quantum algorithms uh, to, to, to trade more efficiently. What's going to happen when you get full on quantum speed and I, and there's a crawl, walk, run strategy, but let's just assume red end game, whether you're a green wave guy or you're a traditional, uh, you know, big monster Vogon, uh, uh, Klingon looking machine that's, that's running qubits. Um, there, this, it's not going to matter so much about speed of the transaction. It's going to be not about the veracity of transaction. In other words, you'll be able to persist so much seemingly unrelated data. You have more informed decisions and be able to write a better forecast model on where mm -hmm. either the stock is going or where the company is going. And that's what's, those are the ones that are going to win. It's not going to be this, in my humble opinion, uh, having done this for a while, is you're never going to beat the house anyway. So you, you need to be smarter than the house, right? And so right, when you look at when you look at the velocity of trading right now and trading volume, and you look at the people that are getting one millisecond faster, it's not going to be about being faster. It's going to be about being smarter. And that is how you can take just the same way hedge funds take alt data from your mobile phone and see how long you parked in front of Best Buy to determine whether or not it's going to be a good month for for Best Buy. Put put that on steroids with quantum computing. You're going to have all seemingly unrelated data that will tell a better story about where the company's going. And it's the ones that figure out how to, to, to garner and, and organize that thinking into a quantum ledger, into a quantum data environment are the ones that are going to win. And I know that's probably not what most people are thinking, but let's face it. If you've got quantum speed, so are the guys on the floor, <laughs> right? <laughs> so when you're, when you're dealing at qubits and, in, in, in superpositioning and entanglement. Entanglement is a good thing, actually. We'll talk about that in a minute. But they're going to get you either way. So what you really want to look at quantum computing for is there's so much data today in classical compute systems that we don't know what we don't know, and we don't know what questions ask. And that's certainly true for the public markets. So when you start getting into the use of quantum technology, you're going to discover a priori. You're going to discover things you didn't know, and that's going to be your competitive edge. So what you're saying is, all this data is going to be put into either people trading or are you saying people are going to implement these into the algorithm so that it, it trades for them at a, in a trades way. for them based upon discovering insights about where they think the company is going. So for example, you know, when you start, there are things I, I get, there's some really crazy, wicked, smart people out there. Right. So I will give this slight little nuance and something I say on X and I'll get private DM messages. Are you, are you doing this? Because that, based on what you said, the only thing, the only thing I can think, and you're like, whoa, danger, Will Robinson, right? <laughs> so you know, those guys, there are people out there, and imagine when you're using, you know, quantum algorithms, all of us are going to have kind of that Elon Musk wicked intelligence, right, at the at your fingertips. And so what it's going to become then is the waste. There's going to be the race for more alternative data to enrich, enrich your your purchasing decision rather than speed, honestly. Do you think that if this starts to get too advantageous for the private sector or for people who who don't own a gigantic amount of equity in, in large corporations, do you think that there might be some sort of regulation put down upon this? And do you do you foresee any sort of return to a, a simpler form of stock trading, no matter what it may be? Do you think that they'll... You know, if if you start making too much money off of it, they're going to start clamping down on this in the same way where they have halted trades in the past couple of years. Yeah. Look, if I had my way, we'd go back to, se to May of 1792. <laughs> you know, Washington was entering his, his uh, second administration um, and the Buttonwood Agreement was signed. And what those 20, what those 24, five people got together, I think it was 24, 25. They said, look, all trades are immutable. All trades are transparent, and it's going to be based upon income and, and revenue versus volume, right? Um, I think if we craft um, 
quantum computing for the markets the way we should, then I think you have a real chance, a, a, a once in a generational chance to return to open, honest, stable markets. You know, and people I've talked to I had the great pleasure of spending several hours with, uh, with David Weald, who was the father of the Jobs Act and, you know, a, for, a former executive in the SEC. We we talked about open, honest, stable markets and the opportunity for quantum computing to take us back there. Certainly, there's always going to be those who are going to try and get the edge, you know, extra outside. But there are going to be there's going to be a time. When you re- if when you really start, in, in my humble opinion, the way quantum systems should be built, where you, this is going to be, this is going to be a game chamber. What I tell my friends who look at me said, you know, guys I was in the military with, they're like Hollywood, like your brain has always been out there, and and what I tell them is, guys, the organizations and nation states that dominate in quantum computing will own the global economy for the next one hundred years. And this is this is the space race. And so when you start thinking about, you know, what this will do for for markets, I love the fact that when you start getting into things like Sphinx plus hashes, where it's impossible to to decrypt something and people's identity are more secure and you start aligning commercial activities against global industrial categorization standards in real time. So your commercial market activity have direct correlative impact on capital markets and it's open and transparent and there's no more alt data being funneled to hedge funds. It's going to be a great equalizer. And I think I, I'm, I'm the guy that believes that the more you make things open and transparent and immutable, then you get less of the good old boy and more of the, we all can win together kind of thing. And, and, and that's where, you know, I, I, I've been a ardent, uh, you know, federalist, publius kind of guy since since I was a, a young cadet. So I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, open, honest, stable markets. I'm 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 against tyranny, of the minority and, and, and tyranny, of the majority for that fact. I, I think quantum is going to be have such a socioeconomic impact that in the hands of the right people, um, it's going to it's it could be a reset in many areas. And one area I think is the stock market. Now, do you think that this has the potential to be, I don't know if I even want to use the term abused, but in a space like crypto, where it's basically unregulated, yeah. uh, do you think there's some people who are probably, probably already using it that are getting way far ahead? Because when I look at some of these coins, I don't have the the willpower to pay attention to, um, what is it, Dogeal on Mar- Mars, which is worth one one millionth of a cent U.S., and yeah. then to trade it when it gets to two one millionths of a cent. Do you think people are using this already on a very, uh, you know, broad level um, to make uh, m- tons of transactions like this? Yeah, I mean, crypto, crypto, I, I look at crypto probably, you know, and I, I know when I start talking crypto, I tell everybody, when I watch crypto environments, it's like watching religious denominations argue, right? <laughs> it's 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 really an interesting dynamic. Mm-hmm. Um, what I think what I think blockchain did for us was show what the what the potential value of ledgers can be, but it's certainly, you know, the the energy and the speed. It, it's certainly, I mean, it's certain in my opinion. You know, blockchain is kind of like the kid that ate Play-Doh in the back of the room. It's just, it's interesting, but it, it's really not. What it did is it's done a phenomenal job in showing the idea of cryptographic type of transactions. I think, you know, I think it's going to continue, but I think it's going to morph, especially when you start seeing quantum database technologies where you're going to start seeing a fusion of the two. But to answer your question, you know, there are people out there that can write quants on crypto as well as they can on the markets. And there are people that are doing that. Um, again, when you start looking at, at cryptocurrency and you start looking at quantum computing, certainly it's going to be far easier, far easy to be unscrupulous to write a quant on crypto without any, without any problems from any government. So I think that's probably going to make crypto a lot less uh, fair when you start throwing quantum algorithms at cryptocurrency that's not regulated. So, you know, it's the Wild West. I don't know how much longer it's going to stay that way. But the short answer is, I think quantum algorithms are going to have a greater impact in the shorter amount of time because there's no regulation on cryptocurrencies. And I know people employing them. Heck, my chief scientist and I wrote an approach for, for a cryptocurrency about a year and a half ago. We said, nah, 
we're not, we're not going to deploy it, right? We just don't want that hassle. But I mean, there are people out there that are probably running them quietly already. There was another note in the email I got about how this can relate to R and D towards. I think it was weapon system. Am I right yeah. on that? Can you, yeah. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, so like when you think about when you so at the end of the day, when you think of weapon systems, you can look at them as you know either being you know trigger pulling type weapon systems or you can think about them being in in intelligence gathering systems uh certainly what it's going to do i mean certainly what's going to do is enhance discovery and non-obvious relationships um i've had some opportunities in my past to build systems for the dod and intelligence systems and i, and I saw firsthand the benefit of big data analytics and and the precursor to ai i i think what you're going to see is um Quantum computing is going to run so many scenarios in 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 tangible in, in in tandem to each other. You're going to see concepts of entanglement between data systems, and when you see those intersections of of entanglement, you're going to get non obvious discoveries, which will help in course of action development. It will help in response. Uh, it will help in threat forecasting. It will. I, I mean, certainly, it's going to help in. When you think about threat forecasting is looking at the adversary's most probable course of action. You're going to see really good analytics on that. Uh, when you apply it to drones, I mean, it really gets to the point. Like right now you're seeing, you know, 5,000 drones come together and, and look like a dragon flying in the sky, right? When you start taking those and put some kind of micro weapon delivery systems in real time uh, using quantum algorithms, you're going to defeat any air defense systems and and you know, take out that tank that it cost you $4 billion to build for the cost of a drone. So I think that's where you're going to see the greatest impact is uh, being able to leverage low-cost delivery systems with high intelligence. What comes after that, though? Let's say your enemy has the same capabilities, which I, I doubt it would take very long for a company like China to get. Maybe I'm wrong. But what happens when we've both got, you know, fleets of drones using micro weapons? What are we even fighting at each other with anymore? Are we just having drone attacks or is it is it just, you know, going to be a decoy for for technology or for information technology warfare and, and hacking and stuff? Do you have a prediction beyond that? Yeah, I think the prediction is going to be it's the same thing. You know, we used to say uh, as a military officer, you always want to get left to bang, right? You don't want to wait for a bang to happen. So I, I think what you'll see with quantum computing is it's going to, while you're looking at the real-time situation play in front of you, you're going to have better decision-making uh, to get left of what the outcome is going to be. So I think where you really want to apply quantum computing in the first part is do everything you can to get left left to bang. You don't want bang to happen because then you're in reaction mode. So first thing is if you get left to bang, you can make better decision-making. Once you start making better decision-making, better tactics come out of it, and then usually you make... Uh, you know, you can seize the day and you can seize the initiative. As far as weapon systems are, are concerned, it's certainly going to enable you to be more creative in, in taking dumb technologies and using really innovative, innovative ways to deliver them. Uh, when you start taking a look at, you know, whether they're, whether they're drones or whether how we implement uh, mortar rounds more efficiently with doing some really interesting things, uh, you're going to see at the nuanced level go all the way from, the existing systems all the way back into the supply chain. And you're going to see some really interesting modifications you can make uh, deep in the initial design phases that will have huge impact in the, in the battlefield. Right now it's drones. Tomorrow it's going to be, you know, I mean, the guys who come up, I mean, you, you look at uh, people that are going to start leveraging, um, you know, quantum attack vectors to basically disable systems. So, so it's no longer going to just, I'm going to use brute force to, to hack your system. It's I'm going to be able to, create um, different wave functions across a broadcast that will be so disruptive uh, and modulation frequencies that are moving at such a rapid rate, it's impossible for the human to understand they're going to really mess up communications. So across the spectrum, across all the operational um, centers of gravity within within combat, you're going to see from every single one of the combined arms, um, you know, you'll see the signal core or the signals and SIGINT guys be much more efficient you're going to see uh, threat intelligence guys get much more efficient because non-obvious discovery will start happening where you'll be able to identify course of actions literally in real time, just on how someone's deploying the troops. It's it's really going to be 
an interesting environment when you talk about threat activity. And I wasn't expected to go and you know my past and talk about this stuff today, but on a on a on a in a military application, it's just you know the asymmetry of it all are going to basically be. We've already seen war become more asymmetric, right? When you start looking at the ability to amplify that with quantum algorithms, it's going to be unrecognizable, unrecognizable. And what what did you do in the military? So I started my career as a, a airborne ranger infantryman, right? Okay. And uh, then went on to do some really interesting things in tech. So uh, I've been a guy that fell out of airplanes and uh, and understand. Uh, I think that's part of the reason why I have really focused on building, you know, strong systems that, you know, will withstand attacks. So I think that's part of the, 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 the allure I saw with quantum computing. When you look at technologies, I'm sure you heard of it, Sphinx Plus. You know, I can take your passport, ingest it, and generate today a 6,016 character hash. It's impossible to hack. Now, all of a sudden, you're moving through a new version of the internet where your identity identity is unhackable. It's mind-boggling. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to ask you, working in this space, I've seen a lot of, when I've done a lot of research on a lot of these companies, particularly, um, you know, uh, tech security companies, a lot of them end up hiring former intelligence agents. A lot of them are started by former intelligence agents. Is this yeah. something that you would embrace? Is this something you're worried about? Is this something you're trying to fend off? What's your opinion on that? <laughs> I, if you brought any former combat arms guy and asked him about his opinion on intelligence, I promise you will get an interesting answer. But um, <laughs> uh, my opinion on that is... Um, I said this a long time ago about artificial intelligence is going to be more true about uh, quantum intelligence. Artificial intelligence is about taking hardware technology and software technology and mimicking human behavior. The decision you want to make when it comes to combat is do you want to mimic Leonidas or do you want a guy that has a Star Wars figurines on his desk with Cheeto stained fingers, right? Those are the kind of decisions. It's true. And then when, when you move into quantum computing, you know, what you're going to be able to do is take all the knowledge of the guy with the Cheeto stained fingers, plus the aggressive mindset of Leonidas and put them together through concepts of, we were, I was talking to my chief scientist today. We, we were showing a real time example today. It was mind, mind boggling of this, this data set within a data coalition that's never touched this data set within a data coalition. And we combined them and created this real time. He's a former, he's an MIT guy. And we literally saw today the creation of collective intelligence. We saw entanglement happen, which was mind-boggling. Two separate corpores of data. One was talking about a concept that was way on one end of the spectrum. One was talking about uh, data on another end of the spectrum. We merged them, and then we ran a, a very basic analytic tomograph on it. And you saw seemingly unrelated things become relatable. Now, think about that. When you're going to from the military perspective, so you've got this guy that's you know a really good analyst, right? He's got Star Wars figures on his desk, and then you got this benching 385 that jumps out of airplane and has real combat experience, and you start taking those two authentic experiences and you entangle them. It, and we saw that happen today, so I think that's what you're going to see is it's going to be the sum. Quantum computing is going to rapidly enable concepts like entanglement, where you're going to see seemingly unrelated data create a whole new a uh, create a whole new a outcome really interesting and i and i'd be interested to see how that gets implemented in pro to be honest through proxy wars because i wonder how much i mean i don't i'm not going to make you pick a side but in, in this when you see like how can ukraine survive this long in a war like this i think the reasons are obvious of uh, from where they get help from and then I look at another side in my training and you see that a lot of the, the training they put through the military uh, was old Soviet strategic, you know, uh, movements. And, and I wonder how much that stuff would get implemented on a battlefield now and how much it would be effective against an enemy who's not aware of it being used. Is there any, no, I mean, if you look, go ahead. Yeah. I, I, you're dead on. If you look at classic Soviet era style where you had your, your vanguard elements out front and, you know, and, and, and seizing and seizing the ability to pivot on the, on the battlefield, you know, what's winning the day right now are asymmetric systems. It's thing. It's, it's literally, I mean, the thing that blows my mind, which, you know, it was kind of ridiculous when you see this, you know, kind of drone float over and, you know, that drops this little flimsy bomb down and it has impact. That's pretty embarrassing when you just spend a billion dollars on a tank, right? 
Uh, I think what's going to happen is quantum computing. I mean, if you think, I, I th when I look at this, when I think of quantum computing, I, I, I wrote a white internal white paper to a friend of mine still on active duty, and I and I took the basic concepts of Clausewitz and warfare with Der Schwerpunkt to find the operational centers of gravity. What you're going to find with quantum computing is you're going to see all the derivations of those. So when when you look at and this is important when you look at you know being able the concept of entanglement and you look at when you try to forecast you know I'm going to go a little deep in military jargon what's the enemy's most probable course of action what you're going to see is you're going to be able to you're, you're going to be able to you know surface multiple uh, probable courses of action and provide real time weighting in real time weights in real time based upon how they're maneuvering whatever intelligence you get. And that's assuming you're not using a quantum waveform over the airwaves that's making your systems ineffective to gather intelligence. It's it's just taking the existing concept of warfare and, and bringing it to a whole new level. And, I, you know, while I could spend all day talking about, you know, the conflict with using quantum computing right now, I think the most exciting part about it is is really doing some really interesting things like creating open, honest, stable markets. Uh, you brought it up yourself, so I added, you know, when you have a, when you take your human identity and you put it on a quantum ledger database and you, you protect your identity and you have custodianship over your identity, you're looking in a very near purchase. You're an ideal customer profile to so many people when you're able to literally publish all your credit card transactions out in the open and they never know who you are. And those credit card transactions are indexed by the same exact standards that are used by the public markets. You're looking at the human identity being at the intersection of commercial and capital markets. In other words, in a very short period of time, you're going to get paid for being you. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, think about it. Your data, you started this whole segment off uh, with, you know, people steal your data. Well, l let's walk through that. I mean, it's not like cybersecurity is working too well, is it? I mean, we've gone to $11 trillion in cybercrime, but we still have companies with these huge name brands. I won't say them out loud, but 16 year old kids from Moldova are still hacking databases. Mm -hmm. Right. And the fundamental problem, the fundamental thing is once you go to quantum and that person's identity is completely quantum proof and all his or her transactions are out in the open, you don't, you, you may know the city it was purchasing. You may, the, the product they bought is indexed against the global industrial categorization. Now all of a sudden all my credit card transactions start to look like a really cool ETF and people are going, I'd really like to sell something to this person. Right. Mm. And so you're going to see the increase, the more human identities become obfuscated, it's going to increase the value right now. There is no value. It, what's amazing about amazing about data today is I really loved what you said in the very beginning is it's your data, right? It's coming off your mobile phone. You're entering and typing. Isn't it amazing how when companies get to go, oh, it's our data. It's, yeah. it's our data, right? Wait a minute. Where's the governance and provenance? Wait, I gave it to you. And then you do such a bad job protecting it that you send me a little card when it gets when it gets when it gets hacked. But meanwhile, the people that downloaded your database from your SQL database that one of those guys with the Cheeto stained fingers was developing, you know, it gets hacked and it ends up on the dark web. And then then it gets sold through multiple data brokers, finally gets into a reputable company, and then it becomes their data. <laughs> but it's still yours, right? So I want to so ask think, you about that. I want to narrow yeah. it down a little bit. When these companies get hacked, um, you know, there's been plenty, PlayStation, Xbox, all these different places that have their user data hacked. How much does one of these hackers make off of selling that data and how do they make money off of selling it if somebody along the line knows it's stolen right does it just yeah. get washed in some way that somebody doesn't care anymore like let's say i don't know gig amazon buys it they didn't buy anything lawyers yeah. legal company how does yeah. how does that make the transfer and how much money can these operators make off of that S significant um because you have to look at data as an oil Right. So if you're, you're ever, you ever going to Texas and held data in the palm of your hand, it's just <laughs> dead, lumpy dinosaur. Right. It's just nasty. But what happens is we put that we put that data into a container and then we get these petroleum engineers and they refine it for different kinds of fuel, aircraft fuel, automobile fuel, diesel, whatever. Right. And then that fuel is that powers, you know, our industrial systems today. Well, data is the new oil. So what happens is. Data scientists refine your data into information 
And then what happens is mm. it get it, it gets enriched with, okay, spatially, where's this at? Temporally, when did it happen or when will it happen? Thematically, what are the concepts? And what does it semantically mean to the individual? Well, when somebody takes your data, they put that data and refine it into the context of their semantic desire to sell you a product. Mm. When it, you get hacked, let's take healthcare data. When your healthcare data gets hacked, which is by far the most popular data, by the way, it and it gets hacked. And that 16-year-old kid from... Moldova, you know, figured out how to hack online with a, 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 a course. And then literally because he could basically identify attack vector through an open port that should have been closed a long time ago that NIST has been screaming at, hey, don't leave this port open, but somebody doesn't do it. They download that data and now they've got this huge amount of data. They, they take that data, they put it in the dark web, but because they've stolen from other people, they'll go grab, you know, technologies that are out there and they'll enrich it and they'll compile I'll look for the same email. Well, now all of a sudden I've seen them. I've seen these databases that have 40 columns of all the things they bought and it, from multiple locations. And then they put that off to a non-reputable data broker who then breaks it into other data brokers. And eventually it works its way back into the community, hmm. right? You know, whether it's, and then, and by the way, it ends up in the hand of government agencies too, in the earnest attempt. So all these people that have cryptocurrency, you know, Trust me, the government knows your wallets already, right? Just through through traditional hacks right now. So that's how it works. It's one person does the exploitation. They quickly move it to several other parties. They cleanse it so it doesn't look the same, whether it's changing headers or data. They mix it with lots of other data. And then what they're able to do is start creating, you know, the ability to obfuscate where it originally came from. And then once you obfuscate it two or three levels deep, where one guy does a better job of cleansing it, by the time it hits the market, it could be through a reputable source. Mm -hmm. and then someone else buys it that's that's wild you know that's something that i would uh, kind of assume happened but i can't articulate it as well as you would let me ask you another question could you put a number yes, on sir. it maybe a percentage of how many people are actively trying to protect their data like on a civilian level like there's not many people i talk to and i'm not a brilliant person who are going through all their settings and turning everything off there's only me yeah. and a few other people i know do you have a, per a ballpark percentage on how many people you think are doing that right now in the united states everybody's you know the things we do in life you know echo across everything we do it's sometimes people are passionate about a certain area and you do it but most people are just like eh, you know they've already stole it anyway what good is it mm -hmm. the average person doesn't understand that they're a quintillionaire <laughs> i mean the average person no seriously data is the new oil and everybody out there is an oil tycoon and and the the greatest the greatest kind of dupe that's happened to the american consumer is convincing them that their data isn't worth anything that's interesting because, you know, if if you can convince a person what they have isn't worth anything, then you can obviously take all of it without any any pushback. And I want to ask you about, I interviewed a woman at a tech conference, I think it was in the summer, maybe June or July or something. And what she was positioning, which sounded crazy at the time, now it's not as crazy as sounding as I thought it was. She was suggesting that everybody create an their own AI identity that acts in protection of themselves online. Now, she went as far as to say these should be their own physical beings, which I thought was the crazy part, right? Uh, an AI, a kind of an avatar that works for you in the world. But if applied in an online sense, if everybody had an anonymous, you know, uh, personality working on their behalf to protect basically an algorithm working on their behalf to protect their data that wouldn't be so crazy and that kind of sounds like what people might start selling to people as protection isn't it yeah it's not crazy uh you know i offered you when we get off this call to show you something i'm going to show you precisely that working today it's out there okay it's done well it's gonna any, blow your mind. is there anything else you want to address before we uh get into the secret parts yeah no i i mean and the biggest thing that um that's exciting about the era we live in right now is what I, what I get up each day. The reason why I just get up each day, just jacked out of my mind to be here <laughs> is where, where we're going and where we're going. First of all, as I said before, it's a national imperative. We win. It's a national imperative. It's like, there is no second place, right? I was talking to one of your associates in the press last week. I mean, it's not going to be like second prize is getting tang from the space race. <laughs> you're, you're, you're not. Right. Mm -hmm. This is you must win. You must seize the hill, smoke the cigars and declare victory. 
You have to. This is a this has to be an American generational, operational, organizational, and national imperative. It has to happen. It, it and the and the reason why is you know, and it's a hard thing to say to ninety nine percent are like, what the heck is quantum computing? Is that Star Trek? I mean, like people are like, what does that mean? I mean, we are in this. What I want to get the average person to understand is, you know, whatever you do, whether it's me our company or some company get involved in quantum computing somehow because how many times you you know i can remember i remember 1994 i was i think i just made captain i was a real young guy at the time right and people were talking about the internet and one of my buddies like dude you got to drop some coin take your extra like we got some extra we got some you know save up your jump pay and you need to buy this stuff called yahoo I'm like, are you kidding me? What is that? Some kind of social disease? Like, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I remember wondering what Yahoo was, you know, and and it's going to be one of those moments. Quantum computing is 1994 when, you know, Good Morning America was arguing what the at symbol meant. <laughs> like it's it's rare in history that you have a chance to do a do over. And mm -hmm. I mean, it's history repeating itself. I mean, in the 1800s, everybody was super jacked out of their mind that they could basically go take this piece of paper and some of the in Western Union sent it across, took like a minute to get all the way to San Francisco. And then someone with a nice little hat, you know, delivered it. And within an hour, your cousin got a message from me. Like, woohoo, we're happy. <laughs> and then, and then this guy's like, Watson, come here. I need you. And the telephone came. Right. And then internet came about and everybody's like, yeah, well, who cares? You know, internet's nothing. Right. This is one of those moments. I mean, what you're talking about the ability to do is start leveraging wavelengths of light to more efficiently refine data into important information and create a more authentic version of you an authentic intelligence. And when two of you get in the same room, that entanglement creates a collective intelligence yielding discoveries that are mind boggling for the common person. And so what I tell everybody is we get involved, start learning what quantum computing is. It's going to be the, it's going to be the wealth generator generator for the next 100 years. Turn it up, Jordan.